Hello, fellow teachers, and welcome to Teaching with Power. This is Ben Wilcox, and I want to thank you for letting me be a part of your scripture study or your lesson prep this week. My goal is to help you to either teach or study the scriptures with more relevancy and power. This week, we're going to be finishing up the book of 2 Nephi by covering chapters 31 through 33. It's a bit of a shorter week, but there is a lot of great material in these three short chapters. So remember, teachers, if you're interested in getting access to the materials that I put together for teachers to help them reduce their preparation time, increase their confidence in the classroom, and to help them to create edifying classroom experiences, just go to teachingwithpower.com and you're going to find links to each of those resources. Now, if you're ready, grab your scriptures and your marking pencils. It's time to dig deep. For an object, this first part of the lesson, some hiking boots, maybe a hiking stick, or a day pack, just sitting there at the front of the class. And for an icebreaker, I just like to ask my students to share the best hike that they've ever been on, just with the class or with the partner. Where were they? What did they see? What made it enjoyable? Now, I don't exactly know if this icebreaker or approach to the lesson is going to work for every teacher out there. I guess it kind of depends on how enjoyable you find hiking or spending time in the outdoors. But for me, that's one of my favorite things to do. I love the outdoors. And specifically, I like challenging myself in the outdoors. I love climbing mountains, and I love exploring desert canyons. And lucky for me, I live in Utah, where both of these types of experiences are available in abundance. I just find it very fulfilling, engaging, and enjoyable. There's just nothing quite like standing on the top of a high mountain as a reward for determined, continuous effort over a stretch of miles. Or there's nothing quite like the thrill of descending the narrow, sculpted, slot canyons of southern Utah, often only accessible with ropes and climbing gear, and a specific knowledge set and skills in order to do so. So to begin the lesson, I might show a number of pictures portraying some of these beautiful places that I've been able to go to. I'd also allow members of my class to share some of their favorite places and experiences in the outdoors. But there's a reason that my thoughts turn to hiking and canyoneering while I was studying 2 Nephi chapter 31. Nephi is going to use a metaphor to help us to understand an essential doctrine of the gospel. I might even call it the key doctrine of the gospel. But what is that metaphor? What thing does Nephi continually refer to throughout the chapter? Let's see if you can find it in chapter 31, verse 9, 18, 19, and verse 21. Did you find it? It's a path, a trail, so to speak. And what kind of a path is it? It's a straight, S-T-R-A-I-T, meaning narrow, and narrow path. I know, a little redundant. It's kind of like saying it's a narrow and narrow path. Verse 21 doesn't use the word path, but a synonym for the word path away. He says, and now my beloved brethren, this is the way, and there is none other way. That's going to be our central metaphor for the lesson, a narrow path. Nephi is going to compare that path or way to a doctrine of the gospel. And what is that doctrine? He's going to mention it at the beginning and at the end of the chapter. So what is the way? What is the path? Look in verse 2 and in verse 21. What doctrine are we going to be studying today? The doctrine of Christ. He says in verse 2, Wherefore the things which I have written sufficeth me, save it be a few words which I must speak concerning the doctrine of Christ. And in verse 21, about halfway through the verse, And now, behold, this is the doctrine of Christ, and the only and true doctrine of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, which is one God without end. Amen. There it is, very clear. 
this is the way. This is the doctrine of Christ. He begins the chapter with that statement and concludes the chapter with that statement. So what would we expect to find in the middle of those bookends? The doctrine of Christ. Here's what it means to be a Christian, a disciple. And really, besides the Sermon on the Mount, this chapter is perhaps one of the best descriptions of discipleship that we can find anywhere in the scriptures. And we get it in plain, straightforward language. As Nephi explains in the second half of verse 2 and all of verse 3. Wherefore, I shall speak unto you plainly, according to the plainness of my prophesy. For my soul delighteth in plainness. For after this manner doth the Lord God work among the children of men. For the Lord God giveth light unto the understanding. For he speaketh unto men according to their language, unto their understanding. Nephi is going to get down to the basics. Perhaps in a way admitting that some of his book has been a little bit tougher to understand. He's quoted his father Lehi. And maybe some of us struggled with the heavily philosophical second Nephi chapter two. He's quoted his brother Jacob, and maybe some of us struggled a bit with the deeply doctrinal second Nephi nine. And then he's extensively quoted his prophet hero, Isaiah. And I'm pretty sure that many have struggled with the symbolism and figurative language of that Old Testament prophet. But now Nephi wants to be as straightforward and simple as he can possibly be. He's going to lead us, guide us, walk beside us, and help us to find the way. So I like to approach this chapter as a personal study guide, a handout, and to encourage my students to have a personal experience with the chapter. I, I ask them to approach it almost like a personal Q&A with Nephi himself. If you take a close look at chapters 31 and 32, it almost reads like a conversation, like Nephi is anticipating our questions and concerns. So we're going to imagine that there's a type of dialogue taking place with the prophet. And I'm going to help you by providing the questions that I think Nephi is trying to answer for us, and then give you a chance to interpret what you think Nephi is saying in response to our questions. And as a teacher, I wouldn't approach this as a one answer fits all. We're not going to go through and correct it to see if you got the answers right. We're just going to go through and I'll share my answers and thoughts, but yours may be different and so will your students. And that's okay. This handout is more intended to be a vehicle to discussion, to get us thinking about the counsels and teachings of Nephi. So here we go. Question number one, what is the destination of the doctrine of Christ? What's our end goal in life? I feel it's important to first establish what the doctrine of Christ is leading to. What do our heavenly parents hope to accomplish with this doctrine? To go along with our hiking metaphor, what's the destination? Personally, I typically don't like to just go hiking for hiking's sake, although I do enjoy the hiking. I typically like to have a goal in mind. I want to arrive at the peak. I want to go see the arch or the waterfall. I want to complete the canyon. So here, what's our objective or final destination? Verses 15, 18, 20, and 21. The answer is that Nephi tells us that it is to be saved, as it says at the end of verse 15, or to gain eternal life in verse 18 and at the end of verse 20 or to be saved in the kingdom of God. Verse 21. That's our end goal. It's God's end goal for all of his children. I recall the famous statement in Moses 139, where God expresses his eternal mission statement. For behold, this is my work and my glory, to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. That's the purpose of the doctrine of Christ, eternal life our desired destination. That's the peak. And I imagine that attaining that destination is going to be comparable to the feeling that I get standing on top of a mountain or coming around the corner and seeing the waterfall or the crystal blue mountain lake or the overlook into the valley below. Case in point, 
the destination is going to be worth the journey. I still remember the very first peak that I climbed when I was nine years old. It was Lone Peak, the mountain that towers over my home in the southern part of the Salt Lake Valley. And I've been hooked ever since. I fell in love with mountains that day and have continually sought that experience throughout my life. Attaining eternal life, returning to the presence of our heavenly parents, I believe will be similar, but on a much higher level. That prompts our next question, question number two. If that's my purpose, how do I get there? How do I gain eternal life? What's the trail, the path, the way? Whenever I go on a hike, one of the first things I do is research the trail. I need to know where the trailhead is. Uh, I want to know how far I need to go. And I'll typically download a GPX track that I can follow on my phone as I go. Makes it simple. Nephi is going to describe this path in the simplest, most plain way he knows how. Now, there's one idea that he repeats again over and over in this chapter. It's in verse 10, verse 12, verse 13, and verse 16. This is the simple answer to... What is the way? Verse 10, And he said unto the children of men, Follow thou me. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, can we follow Jesus, save we shall be willing to keep the commandments of the Father? Verse 12, And also the voice of the Son came unto me, saying, He that is baptized in my name, to him will the Father give the Holy Ghost, like unto me. Wherefore, follow me and do the things which ye have seen me do. Verse 13. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, I know if ye shall follow the Son, with full purpose of heart, acting no hypocrisy and no deception before God, but with real intent, repenting of your sins, witnessing unto the Father that you are willing to take upon you the name of Christ by baptism, yea, by following your Lord and your Savior. Let me stop right there. And then verse 16. And now, my beloved brethren, I know by this that unless a man shall endure to the end in following the example of the Son of the living God, he cannot be saved. Simplified Nephi's answer. Two words. Follow Christ. That's it. That's Nephi's plain answer on how to gain eternal life. Jesus is the original trailblazer. He walked the path laid it down before us, came down to earth. So it would make sense that Jesus is going to proclaim in the gospel, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14, 6. Is it any wonder then that the entire program of scripture study that we're currently engaged in is called Come, Follow Me? It is the invitation of the gospel. That's what it means to be a Christian. It's to seek to follow the example of Jesus Christ, to strive to walk the path that he walked, live like he lived, love like he loved, obey like he obeyed. We follow the example of the Son of the living God, and if we don't, we cannot be saved. Just like you're never going to make it to the top of the mountain if you don't hike trail. And and if we're like, Lord, I'm sure your trail is great and the views are wonderful, but it's a little rocky, a little steep for my liking, a little too long. I'm not sure I want to make that climb. It looks too challenging. I think I'm just going to take another trail. This trail over here, this one looks easier, not so difficult. And, And hopefully it's going to lead to some stunning vistas and beautiful panoramas that you always talk about. And Jesus looks at us and he says, no, no, there is no other way. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you want to get to the top, then you've got to hike my trail, the trail that I've established. You can see that same idea expressed in different terms as well. Look in verses 9 and 17. Same idea, different words. Verse 9, having set the example before them. 17, Wherefore, do the things which I have told you, I have seen that your Lord and your Redeemer should do. Now that 
answer may seem too simple for some. If I want eternal life, then follow Christ. But maybe we need to get just a little more specific. Nephi is going to go deeper for us, but he's still going to keep it plain. And maybe we ask him, okay, I need to follow Christ, but what specific things did Christ do that I need to do? What is Christ's path to eternal life? How did he gain it? If you look in the following verses and compare them, what ideas pop up repeatedly in them? And on the study guide, I've even given you the first letter of each one to help you out a bit. And the first one here is probably the most significant because all of the others are contained within it. It's the big thing. What is it from verses 7, 10, and 14? Know ye not that he was holy, but notwithstanding he being holy, he showeth unto the children of men that according to the flesh he humbleth himself before the Father and witnesseth unto the Father that he would be obedient unto him in keeping his commandments. Verse 10, And he said unto the children of men, Follow thou me. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, can we follow Jesus, save we shall be willing to keep the commandments of the Father? 14, But behold, my beloved brethren, thus came the voice of the Son unto me, saying, After ye have repented of your sins, and witnessed unto the Father that ye are willing to keep my commandments. The idea, keep the commandments. That's what Christ did. He always followed his Father's will. Obedience to God's will is the way I follow Christ. Jesus set that perfect example for us. And Nephi is going to give us a prime example of that 100% obedient mindset of Jesus. What's one thing that Jesus did that showed how willing he was to keep his Father's commandments? Verses 4 through 8, verses 11 through 14, and verse 17. It's his baptism. And we don't want to get too caught up in the doctrinal message of Christ's baptism that we miss the reason Nephi is referring to them here. Jesus' baptism is a bit of an illustration. It's not a section so much about Christ's baptism, although it certainly does help us to understand that better as it is about Christ's attitude when he was baptized. So Nephi says, Wherefore, I would that ye should remember that I have spoken unto you concerning that prophet which the Lord showed unto me, that should baptize the Lamb of God, which should take away the sins of the world. And now, if the Lamb of God, he being holy, should have need to be baptized by water to fulfill all righteousness, oh then, how much more need have we being unholy, to be baptized, yea, even by water. And now I would ask of you, my beloved brethren, wherein the Lamb of God did fulfill all righteousness in being baptized by water. Know ye not that he was holy? But notwithstanding he being holy, he showeth unto the children of men that according to the flesh he humbleth himself before the Father, and witnesseth unto the Father that he would be obedient unto him in keeping his commandments. Wherefore, after he was baptized with water, the Holy Ghost descended upon him in the form of a dove. So Jesus' baptism was a prime example of his attitude towards his Father's will. He wanted to fulfill all righteousness. By being baptized, Christ was witnessing before the Father that he would be obedient, without excuse. If there was anybody who ever had somewhat of a valid excuse not to be baptized, Jesus would be it, wouldn't he? He could have said, look, I don't need my sins washed away. I haven't got any. I don't really need to take this step to enter into the way because I am the way. But Christ wanted to fulfill all righteousness. It's like the exact opposite attitude of that one we looked at last week in chapter 28, the eat, drink, and be merry, nevertheless fear God, he will justify in committing a little sin. That's the, oh, we, we can get away with a bit, right? God doesn't expect that much out of us. But the attitude that's going to bring us to eternal life is the, I want to fulfill all righteousness. 
the kind of attitude that Jesus showed. That's one of the most important ways we follow Christ. We approach God's commandments with the same mindset. Make a commitment, a covenant of obedience to follow our Father's will and make no excuses or rationalizations even when we feel we might have a legitimate claim to ignore them. We've got to begin the climb with that understanding. If we want to get to the destination, then we've got to follow the established trail. And that trail of obedience includes being baptized, like Jesus was. But there's more. Not only do I need to be baptized, but, and I'm not going to read all of these specific verses, but I need to, in verse 8, 12, 13, 14, 17, and 18, receive the Holy Ghost. In verses 11, 13, and 17, repent. And then in verse 19, I'm going to need to have faith. Now, those things should look familiar to us. Remind us of the fourth article of faith, the first principles and ordinances of the gospel. But I don't think it serves us to look at these as steps or a checklist or a linear progression. Like, okay, I start with faith. All right, now I need to repent. And then I'm going to get baptized and so on, and then leave the former steps behind as we complete each one. I wouldn't look at these things as signposts or stopping points or mile markers. I used to look at it that way, but not anymore. I believe that each of these principles is a way of life. They, they are the trail of the doctrine of Christ. The fact that Nephi doesn't really express these ideas in a neat one, two, three, four kind of order speaks to that idea. It's kind of what led me to that insight in the first place. I was trying to teach the lesson, prepare a lesson in this nice linear way, faith, repentance, baptism, gift of the Holy Ghost. But then it kind of dawned on me. I, I couldn't make that work. You just see Nephi going back and forth, talking about all of these principles holistically. I mean, he doesn't even mention faith until verse 19, which is what we usually consider to be the first step. But if I view these things as the trail together, then I realize that I am always going to need to maintain my faith as I follow Christ. I'm going to need to have unshaken faith in him the whole time. I've got to believe the destination is going to be worth the climb. I've got to believe that the trail does continue and lead somewhere that I want to go. Also, with repentance, the more I study that principle, the more I come to the conclusion that it too is a way of life. It's an attitude, a condition of the heart. It's not just a matter of steps that I take every time I sin, the five steps of repentance. Although those are important and they do help me to return my heart to a repentant state but they're not repentance itself. Repentance is a humble, submissive, contrite heart with a deep desire to fulfill all righteousness, to do all that the Father requires. And I carry that repentant heart all throughout my life. And when I find myself getting off that trail, I return to it. Baptism, too, is a continual process. Yes, that there is the actual moment of baptism. It's the gate by which we enter the path or the trailhead. But the covenant or commitment that we make in baptism, the cleansing effect of baptism is a continual renewal each week through the ordinance of the sacrament. Again, a lifetime process. Receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost is continual. The relationship that we nurture with him, the guidance we receive from him, that most certainly needs to be an integral part of the rest of our lives after that moment that we actually receive him as a gift. Nephi's got more to say about that in chapter 32, but we'll get there in a minute. But I think those four things are a good way of kind of summing up the main ideas of verses 4 through 19. But question number four. Once I've done those four things in my life, I've demonstrated faith and repented and I've been baptized and I've received the gift of the Holy Ghost, am I done? Have I made it? Am I at the peak or the final destination? 
That's answered in verse 19. And now, my beloved brethren, after ye have gotten into this straight and narrow path, I would ask if all is done. Behold, I say unto you, Nay. For ye have not come thus far, save it were by the word of Christ, with unshaken faith in him, relying wholly upon the merits of him who is mighty to save. So no, we're not there yet. Uh, we've only entered the gate. Now, this aspect of the way reminds me a lot of canyoneering. And when you explore a technical canyon, there's the moment that you first drop into the canyon, the first rappel. Now, typically, you're not going to climb back out on that rope. You're going to continue to move down the canyon, encountering multiple other rappels along the way. So, it doesn't make much sense to carry hundreds of feet of rope all the way down the canyon and then set them and leave them there and then climb all the way back out on those ropes. Now you take them with you. So you make your first rappel, and then you pull the rope down and carry it with you to the next rappel. Use it there. And then you pull that rope down and carry it on and so on. But that moment when you pull the rope down from the first rappel, that's a critical one. As long as the rope is still there, you could climb back out and get out. But once it's pulled, you're committed to doing the rest of the can. In fact, that's what they call it. It's called committing to the can. You can never know for sure what obstacles await you in the future or exactly what challenges you might encounter. But you're committed to facing them because there is no other way out. We might refer to that as the gate of the can. To me, that's kind of like baptism. We make a commitment, a covenant to walk that path, knowing that we're going to be facing obstacles and that there is a long road ahead of us before we arrive back home. And so we covenant to take upon ourselves the name of Christ and to keep his commandments and to always remember, to remember the one who first walked that path and created it. But like Nephi says and asks here, once you drop into the canyon, once you step away from the trailhead, are you done? No, you've only begun. You've committed. But now you've got to walk. Starting about halfway through verse 17 here. For the gate by which you should enter is repentance and baptism by water, and then cometh the remission of your sins by fire and by the Holy Ghost. And then are you in the straight and narrow path which leads to eternal life? Yea, you have entered into the gate. Question number five. This is a big one. All right, Nephi, I feel that I have entered the path. Now what? I like to highlight two phrases here. I've given you the first letters to help you out. What do I do? Verse 15, 16, and 20. I endure to the end, and I press forward. Now, those phrases work really well with our hiking metaphor, don't they? Isn't that what hiking is all about? We've got to endure to the end. We can't give up when it gets hard, and it is going to get hard. The very fact that he uses the words endure and press suggests that about Christ's path. It's not the path of least resistance. That's, that's the broad path of the adversary. Again, reminds me of canyoneering. Working your way down a canyon can be quite challenging. It requires a lot of problem solving, obstacle overcoming, and a very physical effort to expect. But there is at least one thing that you don't really have to worry about anymore. That's navigation. When you're in the slot canyon, there's only one obvious way to go. Down the canyon. In that case, it's easy to follow that path because there aren't any other options. The way to go and the end goal is self-evident. Get to the ball. That's it. I think that's kind of like Jesus' way. The straight and narrow path. So yes, Christ's path is hard, but it's also easy. Living the gospel requires problem solving and overcoming obstacles and some difficult work. But at least you know your destination, and the direction that you need to travel is clear. You've got 
a purpose. Satan's broad path, on the other hand, is easier to walk, as the landscape itself doesn't offer much resistance. But the navigation is far more challenging. It's so much easier to get lost while moving over wide open ground. The travel, too, it's, it's aimless. There's no vision, no end point. Just mindless slogging over open ground. That's not the kind of hiking or outdoor experience that I enjoy as much. I want to see something. I think that's what Jesus' path is like. It may require more effort, but the views are inspiring. The path is beautiful. The path is fulfilling. The very fact that you overcome the challenges make it more fulfilled. So our final question for this chapter, there are some specific hiking instructions that Nephi still wants to give us. How do we press forward? How do we endure to the end? How do we hike? There's a number of excellent phrases to describe our daily walk towards eternal life. See if you can pull each of these out. Excluding some of the ideas that we've already talked about, such as repenting of our sins and taking upon ourselves the name of Christ and demonstrating unshaken faith. But look at verses 13, 19, and 20. How do we walk? We must follow the Son with full purpose of art, acting no hypocrisy and no deception before God, with real intent. Verse 19, relying wholly upon the merits of him who is mighty to save. 20, with a steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope, with the love of God, and of all men, feasting upon the word of Christ. Aren't those great? (laughs) I would invite you here to ponder what each of those statements mean. How would you explain those phrases to an investigator of the church? My thoughts? What does it mean to follow the Son with full purpose of heart? Is your purpose, your devotion, and your commitment full? If you had to describe it in terms of a glass of water, is it full, half full, three quarters full, almost empty? Are you trying to serve two masters? Hopefully we can follow with full purpose of heart, acting no hypocrisy or deception, but with real intent. What does that mean? We don't want to be hypocritical. A hypocrite is somebody who preaches one thing, but believes and does another. The root word for hypocrite in Greek means stage actor or pretender. Do we act one way on Sunday or in front of our parents or other people, but then completely different around our friends or when we're by ourselves? Relying wholly upon the merits of him who is mighty to save. And I love this one. We need to rely on Christ, but not just partly but wholly, totally, completely. Remember that Christ pays our debt in full, and we don't earn our way into heaven. Christ's merits, his sacrifice, and his mighty grace saves us wholly. And and in appreciation for his complete gift, I follow him on his way, on his path, relying 100% on that grace. Those great phrases in verse 20. This this is a verse that means a lot to me personally. This is the first scripture that truly and deeply touched my heart that I can remember. I think we all have that first time when a scripture just reaches out and grabs us by the heart. I think I was 12 or 13 when I was reading my scriptures because that's what you're supposed to do, right? And I read this verse and it just... It sunk deep, and a thought entered into my mind. It said, yeah, this is what you need to do. This is your path. This is your manual for life. Do this, and you'll be happy. Press forward with a steadfastness in Christ. Look to Christ as your leader, your guide, your trailblazer. Follow him to the top of the mountain. 
having a perfect brightness of hope. We don't want to follow Jesus with despair or discouragement and and keep saying things like, I'm never going to make it. I'm not good enough. I always fall short. How we press forward with hope, brightness of hope, with joy, with trust, with confidence. I know I can make it. I can make it with Christ. And and I am going to make mistakes, but he'll forgive me. Brothers and sisters, we have so many reasons to be optimistic about our eternal future. If you're on a hike and you just keep saying that you're never going to make it, chances are you're going to give up. We want the brightness of hope and a love of God and of all men. Now, I need to have both of those things. If all I do is love God, then I may excuse the mistreatment of others in the name of religious zeal. And if all I do is love my fellow man, I might be tempted to tolerate and accept all manner of sinful behavior. I've got to be properly balanced between the two. Love God, love my fellow man. Feasting upon the word of Christ. If you don't mind, I'm not going to really elaborate on that phrase yet because Nephi has got more to say about that in the next check. Stay tuned. But isn't that wonderful, that description? Isn't this simple? Isn't this plain? This is the way. Our truth, then, if I wish to gain eternal life, then I must follow the way or the example of Jesus Christ. I think that's probably the simplest way that we can put it. And contained within that one word, follow, is everything else that we just discussed. Follow Jesus by keeping his commandments, by striving to fulfill all righteousness, continuously living the principles of faith, repentance, baptism, and receiving the Holy Ghost feasting upon the words of Christ, pressing forward with the perfect brightness of hope, loving God and your fellow man and everything else that we discussed. The doctrine of Christ is to follow Christ in all things. To take this message more to heart, take a look at the way that we just examined. Which of those phrases meant the most to you today and why? What portion, what phrase did the Spirit emphasize? in your heart. And that leads us into what I will go and do. If you just had to pick one phrase from the chapter that you feel you may need to take some action on, which one would it be? As we've studied together, did, did you sense any promptings within? You? At any point, did you feel something say, I may need to do a little bit better at that, or I need to act on that point? Maybe you haven't been baptized yet. Is that your next step? Maybe you need to have a little more brightness of hope. Maybe you just need a little encouragement to continue pressing forward and enduring to the end. Whatever it was, if you felt something, let the Spirit guide you. I encourage you to be open to responding to those promptings as we each examine our own level of discipleship. How did you enjoy Nephi's message? Did you feel the power of that simple, plain message of the doctrine of Christ. I'm so grateful for that path. I'm grateful that it's so clear and so defined of a trail and easy to follow in the sense that it's apparent which way is the right way to go. And as phenomenal and spectacular as eternal life or celestial glory is going to be, I hope we don't forget that the pathway itself is also beautiful and spectacular. It's challenging, but just like my beloved canyons of southern Utah or my Wasatch Peaks, the trail itself is half the experience. It's not just about the destination, but it is about the journey too. The thrill of the adventure is so enjoyable and inspiring that it draws me back time and time again for the uplifting experience that they provide. The way of Christ is the same kind of thing, but on a far higher and more meaningful level. I pray that we'll approach our discipleship with that same sense of adventure and wonder. This is the way. This is the doctrine of Christ.
Moving on to 2 Nephi chapter 32. And an object I might display for this chapter would be food. Just any kind of food. Lots of it. I might just raid my pantry and bring in a whole bunch of different kinds of food to set at the front. Fruits, candy, veggies, boxes of cereal, chips, canned food. I don't know. I'd just stack up a bunch right there at the front. And for an icebreaker, I'd share some interesting statistics about food consumption in America. Now, if you don't live in America, feel free to do a little bit of research about eating habits in your own countries. And, and that really shouldn't be too hard to find. But here are some statistics that I might share. The average American eats about 250 pounds of meat or poultry every year. Can you just imagine what 250 pounds of meat would look like on your table? It's a lot of protein. Then it's estimated that the average American consumes around 150 pounds of sugar and sweeteners every year. Now, if you do the math with that one, 150 pounds divided by 365 days in a year, it's just about half a pound of sugar a day. Hey, right, so weigh that out sometime. What's about six to seven ounces of sugar? Uh, what does that look like? And then 20% of all American meals are eaten in the car. So one hand on the steering wheel and, and one holding a Big Mac. And then Americans spend 10% of their disposable income on fast food every year. That's because we want the food and we want it now. We want it fast. Well, I think it's pretty obvious that Americans have a fairly committed relationship to food. We do a lot of feasting in this nation. We eat a lot. In chapter 31, Nephi is going to use the analogy of eating or feasting to teach us an important gospel principle. Let's see what it is. If you look at the end of chapter 31, it seems like Nephi just wanted to end his talk right there. He says, amen, even, right? Like, that should be enough. I don't know how to make the doctrine of discipleship any simpler. You know what to do. Follow Christ. You'll have eternal life, period. But the first verse of chapter 32 seems to suggest that Nephi is about to walk away from the pulpit. And he stops and realizes that we still have a question. What is that question? Verse 1. And now, behold, my beloved brethren, I suppose that ye ponder somewhat in your hearts concerning that which ye should do after ye have entered in by the way. But behold, why do you ponder these things in your hearts? So what's the concern? I think they're saying, but Nephi, how will I know what to do in each moment and each decision of my life? Life is complicated. This seems too simple. How will I know exactly how to act? And you know, that's not a bad question. Maybe you've wrestled with that. The gospel provides us with commandments and principles and standards, but doesn't always give all the specifics, the details. There isn't a 500 page long rule book for us. The church doesn't print out a list of all the movies and music and television shows that are church approved for members to consume each month. The Lord says, keep the Sabbath day holy. And we might say, but how? What exactly is it okay to do and not to do on the Sabbath? Is it okay to watch television? Is it okay to do homework? Hey, give me the rules. Or the Lord says, be modest. And they give us some general principles on how to apply that. But then we might ask, well, how short is short? How tight is tight? How am I going to know exactly how to apply the commandments in every situation? And are there ever times when there are exceptions to the rules? Well, we're going to activity. I want you to put yourself into Nephi's sandals. We're going to treat this as a case study. Put your students into pairs and say that the older of the two, whichever that is, gets to play Nephi. The other person is going to play the role of the questioning disciple. Let's say that person is coming to Nephi and asking that question that we just talked about. How will I know what to do? And first, let them try to answer that question 
without even looking at Nephi's response first. Have them share their advice with that partner who's wondering what to do. But then, send them both into chapter 32, verses 2 through 5, to see how Nephi answers that question. And then, try again, in their own words, to explain what they feel Nephi's answer is. So here we go. Do ye not remember that I said unto you, that after ye had received the Holy Ghost, ye could speak with the tongue of angels? And now, how could ye speak with the tongue of angels, save it were by the Holy Ghost? Angels speak by the power of the Holy Ghost. Wherefore, they speak the words of Christ. Wherefore, I said unto you, Feast upon the words of Christ. For behold, the words of Christ will tell you all things what ye should do. Wherefore, now, after I have spoken these words, if ye cannot understand them, it will be because ye ask not, neither do ye not. Wherefore, ye are not brought into the light, but must perish in the dark. For behold, again, I say unto you that if ye will enter in by the way and receive the Holy Ghost, it will show unto you all things what ye should do. So what's Nephi's answer? Maybe this is how I would summarize it. How are you going to know what to do? Feast upon the words of Christ. Don't just snack on them. Don't graze. Don't nibble. Feast. Indulge your spirit. Lick up your plate. Eat until you're stuffed. Go back for seconds and thirds. Let your soul delight in fat. And now, where do we find the words of Christ? Where's the buffet? The pantry? Well, it's, it's the scriptures. It's the words of the living prophets. It's patriarchal blessings, lessons and talks in church. The more I consume those things, the better I'm going to know what to do. The more guidance I'm going to receive, the more certain I'm going to be that I'm traveling down the correct path. However, there is one particular source of the words of Christ that Nephi seems to be emphasizing here. Yes, those verses can be applied to scriptures and conference talks in church. But above all, he's pointing to the Holy Ghost as the great provider of the words of Christ. How will I know what to do in each moment? And how will I personally apply the words of the scriptures and the living prophets? Get the Spirit. And once you have the gift of the Holy Ghost, feast on its promptings. Listen to them. Follow them. It's going to tell you and show you. I like, I like that he uses those two different verbs in, in those verses. Tell and show. All things what you should do. So it's as if Christ is saying, if you are willing to make a commitment of obedience to following my example, and you press forward and endure, then I'm going to put something inside of you that will tell you what to do. I'll give you the Spirit. You don't need the rule book. The law will be written on your hearts. I'll never forget a training that Elder Bednar gave to all seminary and institute teachers a number of years ago on recognizing and following the Spirit. And he said something that stuck with me ever since. He said, we often make it hard on ourselves to receive personal revelation. By that I mean, a covenant promise is that as we honor our covenants, we may always have the Holy Ghost to be our constant companion. We talk about it and treat it as if hearing the voice of the Lord through His Spirit is the rare event. And that just strikes me as a little curious. It's like, I have to follow these four steps, and the Holy Ghost is going to speak to you. And I go, wait a minute. We shouldn't be trying to recognize it when it comes. We should be recognizing what happens that causes it to leave. It ought to be with us all the time. And gosh, isn't that insightful? That's the way I like to envision it now. It's like your life is represented by a large room. And when you're given the gift of the Holy Ghost, a light comes on in the room. And you can see and do things and make decisions with more clarity and understanding because of the light. What I think Elder Bednar is suggesting here is that it shouldn't be that I spend the majority of my time in the darkness and then I do certain things and the light comes on to help me for a bit. But hopefully, the light is almost always on. And I've got to be wary and careful about the things that I do that turn it off. 
So back to Nephi. And again, it's like he's walking away from the pulpit. He's just about to go. But once more, perceives there's still a question. And so he says in verse 8, And now, my beloved brethren, I perceive that ye ponder still in your hearts, and it grieveth me that I must speak concerning this thing. They're still wondering about something. And, and I'm just going to give you the question, because we realize what the question is as he's giving us the answer. And now you're going to have your student pairs switch places or roles. Now the other person gets to play Nephi. And they're going to try and answer the disciple's question without looking at Nephi's answer yet. The question is, okay, Nephi, how do I get the spirit then? How do I make sure that the light is always on? I'm not sure I feel like the Holy Ghost is always guiding. Now let your Nephi's wrestle with that for a bit. And then give them a chance to read verses 8 and 9, and then answer again with what they feel Nephi is saying in their own words. Nephi's answer, And now, my beloved brethren, I perceive that you ponder still in your hearts, and it grieveth me that I must speak concerning this thing. For if you would hearken unto the Spirit, which teacheth a man to pray, you would know that you must pray. For the evil spirit teacheth not a man to pray, but teacheth him that he must not pray. But behold, I say unto you, that ye must pray always, and not faint that ye must not perform anything unto the Lord, save in the first place, ye shall pray unto the Father in the name of Christ, that he will consecrate thy performance unto thee, that thy performance may be for the welfare of thy soul. So how do you get the help of the Spirit? Pray for it. Pray always. That doesn't mean that we're constantly on our knees or or even saying a prayer in our heart always. We can't live that way. We, we've got to have conversations with other people. We've got to work and play and focus our minds on other things. But to pray always, I feel, is to have a mind and heart continuously open to the mind and will of our Father in Heaven, ever guided, ever illuminated, always having the lights on. We still focus on various tasks on any given day, but we're sure that we always have the light shining on what we do. And, and we do pray physically often on our knees or in our hearts, which I feel is kind of like recharging the batteries that keeps the lights on. But we continuously seek the guidance of the Holy Ghost. And when we do that, and we live like that, then God is going to consecrate our performance, whatever performance that is, whether it's school or work or sports or art, giving a talk, spending time with our family, or five billion other things that we could be doing. It's all going to work toward the welfare of our souls. God will consecrate those performances. He'll make it all good in the end. Even, even if we make some mistakes in interpreting his promptings, even if we feel that it takes a lot of time and practice to learn how the Spirit guides us, just keep praying. Keep relying. And in the end, when we look back on our lives, we'll, we'll see how God made it all good. It reminds me of one of my favorite verses of all time, Romans 8.28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, or that feast upon his words, or that pray always. Truth, if I'm willing to feast upon the words of Christ, they will tell me all things that I should do. And if I pray for the guidance of the Spirit in all things, then God will make good of all I do. And to take it to heart, as a teacher, I might just share a story at that point of a time that I felt I was guided by the Spirit, or a time when I prayed and the Lord made things good. I might share a story of a time when I, I had a very significant financial decision to make in my life. And I felt that the Spirit guided me on what I should do. And it did work out for the welfare of my soul. I want to talk about the numerous times in my life where I've prayed for help with my, with my teaching, my marriage, my calling, my children, my struggles. And I felt the Lord inspire me with guidance, inspiration, and comfort. 
can ask your students if they'd be willing to share a time when they felt that feasting on the words of Christ or, or prayer has told or shown them what to do or brought welfare to their souls. And I bear witness that the guidance of the Holy Ghost is real. And I also bear witness of the power of prayer. I invite us to reflect on our current relationship with those two truths that we've just been brilliantly taught by Nephi. And I can promise that if we approach our hunger for guidance and help from God like a feast, then he will feed us. Second Nephi 33. I'm going to be brief with this chapter, but I'd like to introduce it with some fitting, famous last words, some final phrases, so to speak. Leonardo da Vinci, I have offended God and mankind because my work did not reach the quality it should have. It's always the perfectionist. I think if he says that, wow, I haven't done anything in my life. Benjamin Franklin, with his usual dry wit, a dying man can do nothing easy. John Wayne, he turned to his wife and said, of course I know who you are. You're my girl. I love you. Steve Jobs, oh wow, oh wow, oh wow. Harriet Tubman, swing low, sweet chariot. Joseph Smith Jr., oh Lord my God. Brigham Young, Joseph, Joseph, Joseph. Well, what are Nephi's last four words? What's the last phrase Nephi writes? I must obey. Amen. And isn't that the perfect way for Nephi to end his record? That was his character, his identity, his ethos always obedient, right to the end. And this entire last chapter is a little bittersweet. It's his final testament. We've spent a long time with Nephi, this whole first quarter of the year, basically. Sad to see him go. And I'm not going to elaborate personally too much on his words, but I do have a possible teaching activity that you could do with this last chapter. I've selected a, a number of other powerful one-liners, final phrases from this last testimony of Nephi's. Perhaps a fitting way to end our study of his writings would be to concentrate our attention on one of Nephi's final phrases. So I've listed a number of what I consider to be the most inspirational statements made by Nephi in this concluding chapter. Your job is simple. Choose one that inspires you and be prepared to explain what it teaches you, and why you find it inspiring. Here's the phrases. When a man speaketh by the power of the Holy Ghost, the power of the Holy Ghost carrieth it unto the hearts of the children of men. I pray continually for my people by day, and mine eyes water my pillow by night because of them. I cry unto God in faith, and I know that he will hear my cry. I know that the Lord God will consecrate my prayers for the gain of my people. I glory in plainness. I glory in truth. I glory in my Jesus. If ye shall believe in Christ, ye will believe in these words, for they are the words of Christ. My writings teach all men that they should do good. I pray the Father in the name of Christ that many of us, if not all, may be saved in his kingdom at that great and last day. Aren't those great? I hope you found inspiration and meaning in at least one of those final phrases. But a personal concluding thought. Nephi mentioned something in verse 11 that really caught my attention. It gets me excited. Just the prospect of this moment makes me smile. In verse 11, Nephi speaks of a future encounter between us and him. After testifying that the words that he's written are true, he challenges us to find that out for ourselves, if they truly are the words of Christ. 
And if we happen to come to the conclusion that they're not Christ's words, he offers this rebuff. And if they are not the words of Christ, judge ye, for Christ will show unto you with power and great glory that they are his words at the last day. And you and I shall stand face to face before his bar, and ye shall know that I have been commanded of him to write these things, notwithstanding my belief. I wonder what that might be like for those that have denied the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon, or opposed it, or refused to even consider it as Christ's words. Can you imagine Nephi walking up behind that person, just tapping them on the shoulder and saying, surprise, I'm real, and my words were true. Personally, I can't wait for that day. I want to meet Nephi, and I know what I'm going to say to him. I'll say thank you, Nephi. I believe and I know that your words are the words of Christ. Your writings have enriched my life and they brought me closer to God. I'm eternally grateful for your example and your words. That will conclude this week's lesson so grateful that you spent this time with me this week. I pray that you felt the Spirit. I pray that you learned something. I pray that your love for the Scriptures is deeper. Thank you so much for watching. Now get out there and teach with power.